Long journey here. You've uh, you've come from. Well, you tell me about your journey in the last few days. Oh, uh, I was in Russia two days ago in a little town called Star City. It's about an hour and a half from Moscow. I'm learning to fly a spaceship there, the uh, Russian Soyuz spaceship, and I've been there for years training. But uh, have a chance to leave Russia and come through Montreal, uh, Toronto, and get to Windsor and have a chance to get reunited with the F-86 and fly on the wing of a. Hornet for the Heritage flight. It's a trip worth making. <laughs> and your wife, and to be home with family and back on Canadian soil again. But when when do you leave for this big six-month journey coming up? The launch is November 28th of next year, so still 15 months away. We'll launch from uh, the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Uh, come up and around over the north end of Mongolia, get up to speed. It's take about two days to get to the space station and then go around the world for six months, 16 times a day around the world for six months. Uh, and then I'll be the commander of the spaceship for the last few months there, and then we'll fly the Soyuz back home, hopefully land in about where we took off uh, in just outside of Baikonur, Kazakhstan, in the spring of 2013. Your shuttle landings were uh, things that you're accustomed to, landing fighter jets, landing the F-86, wheels underneath you. You can make it as gentle as your talent allows. Tell me about the landing, though, with the Soyuz. The Soyuz is a three-person capsule. It's a th it looks like a, a salt shaker with three people inside. And you're under a huge parachute, one enormous parachute coming down. And uh, you'd hit the ground really hard if it was just the parachute. So they mount gunpowder rockets on the bottom, and uh, there's a little gamma ray altimeter. And just before you hit the ground, the rockets fire to slow you, your rate by about half. But even still, it's like a car crash. It's Because it's always windy in Kazakhstan. It's like Saskatchewan. So there's always a prairie wind. And so it's not that you're coming down. You're coming across. And so the vehicle goes uh, end over end once or twice. Kind of a rude way to come home after six months of weightlessness. But it's tough. It's reliable. You're in a crash seat. And uh, it gets us home safely. I can't, I, I'm stuck with a visual here as you train for that. What do they put you in a car or something and roll you around? How do you train for that? No, that's practice bleeding. We don't, do, we don't practice for that. We, <laughs> we practice flying the ship and uh, making sure that we can handle all the systems. They talk to us. One, one of the things they tell us is make sure you're not talking while you land because you might bite your tongue off. So. <laughs> it's just a different way of doing things, isn't it? It is, yeah. So that's coming up. What you're doing this weekend is flying uh, an F-86. Mm -hmm. You've flown fighters. You flew the Hornet. Uh, what's it like to fly a vintage uh, flying machine, something that uh, speaks to our history? When I was uh, four years old, my dad brought me to the Windsor Air Show. Uh, and the only thing I remember from that whole trip was the Golden Hawks flying. Uh, these... F-86 is painted in this color. And in fact, the F-86 I'm flying was one of the training airplanes that the team was using that year. And uh, to have that whole circle come around where now I'm one of Canada's astronauts uh, doing some brand new stuff out in space, but to be able to link that directly to what it meant to me as a kid and now maybe in the middle, kids that are coming along now, they can see from air cadets to uh, flying an F-86 to flying in space and commanding a spaceship. It's all one straight line uh, that is connected through the things that I'm having a chance to do. So flying the F-86 means a lot to me at a lot of different levels. The, the professional beauty of that airplane, the, uh, the uh, chance to do something I've dreamed about since I was a kid, and also to be able to link that to the things that I do as an astronaut. It's just a wonderful opportunity in my life. There's kids out there um, all the time. Air Cadets is, is the biggest uh, youth program in the nation, and I know that's how you started. And if you could just speak about Air Cadets for a second. When the first two men walked on the moon, I decided to be an astronaut in uh, July of 69. I looked around and thought, well, what, what can I do to start heading in the right direction? And as a, as a young teen, I mean, what options do you really have? You're going to school. But I looked at Air Cadets. They teach you about the weather, they teach you about aviation, they teach you about engines, they teach you about self-discipline, they let you fly gliders, and then maybe you get your glider pilot's license, and then your powered license, and it's all provided. You, you don't even pay for it. I mean, on scholarships, it's a tremendous opportunity. And so uh, as soon as I was old enough, I joined the Air Cadets and uh, learned to fly gliders when I was, summer I was 15 years old at Trenton, and then summer I was 16 and learned to fly power airplanes out of London. My first solo cross country, was to Windsor Airport. In fact, first place I flew to and then went over to St. Thomas and back up to London. Um, and that's where I learned to fly. 
uh, and then eventually on through the military college and the Air Force and to where I am now. So uh, Air Cadets was enormously good for me and really pivotal in any success I've had as a, as a fighter pilot, test pilot, an astronaut. Uh, tomorrow is, uh, or Sunday, is going to be the, uh, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And uh, I don't think we'll ever forget where we were when that happened, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you today. I was NASA's director in Russia, and we were doing water survival with all of the crews and training down on the Black Sea in a place called Sochi, where they're hosting the Winter Olympics uh, a year and a half from now, I guess. And we got word of it. It was late evening there. We were just coming off a day's training on a ship out in the Black Sea, and uh, we spent an extremely agonizing night over there watching the news pour over into this remote part of Russia, trying to figure out what loved ones from all of the Americans that I was responsible for uh, might have been directly involved, whether this was something that was just the start of a huge event or whether this is a one-day event, trying to sort that out remotely. The Russians were so good to us, helping us out, much as Canadians were helping the airliners out as they were coming in and uh, eventually getting ourselves back to Moscow once flight air travel started again and, and then getting the Americans back home as quick as we could. So I was the boss of the Americans over at the time over there. So it was, it was a stressful and sort of a, a helpless feeling waiting to see what was going to happen. And, uh, and I was very thankful for the support that we got, but also very thankful that the amount of peace that we've had in North America, at least in the decades since, through a lot of hard work on a lot of people's behalf. Chris, thank you very much for the time as always. Have a good flight this weekend, and uh, good luck if I don't see you before you're up there for six months running the space station. Thank you very much. I'll be waving from the F-86, and I'll be waving through the portholes on the space station. Nice.